To me, I think that one of the things that keeps people from really like getting good at marketing is that they feel it's unapproachable. They don't understand what it is. And so they feel like it's something that they can't do, that you need to be some kind of genius to do it. I would say that like, for me, the biggest unlock was understanding that most of what we think of as marketing is actually bad marketing. It's the stuff that like the best marketing stuff you don't actually realize is marketing. Hello, squirrel friends, and welcome back to All Marketing School. It's Fab here, founder and ed teacher at All Marketing School, back yet again with an amazing interview. And today my guest is the incredible Jeremy Enns. Together we're going to talk about storytelling, affinity, marketing, and so much more. He is a fellow marketer, which means we have a lot of things we're going to share some views on. And also we're going to talk together about the power of curiosity and how to use it for your strategy. If you don't know Jeremy, he is the founder of Podcast Marketing Academy where he teaches brands and creators how to hit their growth milestones with detailed step-by-step -step marketing playbooks. He also writes this scrappy podcasting newsletter, where he shares short, actionable ideas around how underdog shows can punch above their weight. He is original from Canada. However, he has been traveling full-time for the past seven years, and in fact, is going to give us some traveling recommendations and advice as well in the show. As always, let me know what resonates with you, and how do you think you can emotionally connect better through your marketing. I hope you're really going to love this episode as much as I loved recording it. And as always, see you next time. But in the meantime, may today's class begin. Welcome back, everyone. Today's episode is not sponsored by Notion, but it is unofficially sponsored by Notion, thanks to Jeremy and I and my love for Notion. I think that's something that now we know we can bond over, the love for Notion. I feel like, yeah, two, two Notion nerds come together. That's, you know, it's going to be good. <laughs> so that's even like a bit of an advertisement for the podcast that you're going to listen to today and our wonderful episode. Um, but to be honest, um, I've known Jeremy for a while and it doesn't surprise me too much because I think it takes a certain type of person, especially for like the things that we love and the way that we work to really love the ways that you set up systems. And if you don't know Notion, it literally is. Uh, something there, Frances from the Notion Bar, who we interviewed on the podcast uh, last season. She loves Notion, obviously. And she talks about it as almost like the online Lego that allows you to build blocks around your life or business. And I think that's a pretty accurate way to describe it for somebody who never used that and cannot really found them what it can do for you. Yeah, that's I, I like that. I, I feel like that is exactly I it makes so much sense. I love Lego as a kid. And now it definitely feels like just stacking all these bricks together in fun and unique ways uh, to build business and creative systems. And goodness knows if maybe some of these things will come out today. I mean, now there's a question that I know we're going to ask and I'm wondering whether the answer is going to be related to Notion. But honestly, if you are not a Notion lover, we understand. I would say just dig in and learn if that could be a tool for you. If you are a Notion lover, then there are plenty of tools. We also have some templates as well that we use. And I generally say that making them yours is such a powerful thing. We also teach in the certification, actually, because I believe that it's so important and Notion can work so well for marketers. I'm sure as podcasters as well. I use it also for the podcast. So I'm sure there's so many systems you can set up for your podcast too, isn't it? Yeah, that's, um, I, as part of my academy, have built out a whole workbook for people in Notion and it's it's pretty extensive and it uh, I probably overdid it <laughs> with building it. Uh, potentially for people who aren't already familiar with Notion, it might be a bit overwhelming, but it's also a great way a lot of people who've come through my program get access to the workbook and they're, they kind of are like a little bit confused and frustrated at first when they start using it. And by the end, like a month later, they're just like, whoa, like I had no idea a system like this existed. And it, it was like a little hard at first, but now I can do so much more and keep track of all this stuff for my show production and marketing, you know, sponsor outreach, collaborations, outreach, all that kind of stuff. Oh my God. Yes. You snap, I should say. Um, we have a lot of conversation with the students because we give options for other tools as well, but what we work predominantly and the systems that we, that we set up together in the certification are through Notion. And I have so many of our students get to the end and they're like, the, one of the best things and I'm like, thanks, is I learned how to use Notion. And I'm like, thanks. But also I'm like, oh, <laughs> but it really this shows the power course. of systems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it really does show that. Now, the funny thing is that we haven't even got to the icebreaker, but I just thought we're going to ease into like some Notion conversations because when there's a, share, a shared love for something like this, it's always worth the while. Um, Jeremy, on that note, maybe the answer is Notion. I'm sure it's not. But I have a question to start us off. And I would love to hear from you if you could choose any <clears throat> trivia category you'd be really good at. Which one would it be and why? Seinfeld. 
uh, without a doubt. I so and why is because I have watched through the entire Seinfeld series. I don't know, probably start to finish like ten times. That may include some of the just like reruns on TV throughout the whole '90s and still. Um, but I feel like there are every single day. I, I almost don't recognize them anymore. Where there'll be moments where I'll like think of the quote or I'll say something. It's just become part of my like lexicon where I'll speak in Seinfeld quotes. And I, at this point, I often don't even realize them or until after the fact. And there are a few like rare, rare moments where I'll like say something or somebody else will say something in public. And I'll be like, and somebody will like either say like Seinfeld quote. And it's just this, it's like our shared notion thing here. It's like, you just spot another one in the wild and it's just like, yes, we're like two of the same people. So uh, yeah, definitely Seinfeld quotes, uh, scenes, trivia, uh, anything like that. All of it. All of it. All of it. Now, sadly, I cannot test you in that one because I'm not <laughs> I'm not that much of a fan. But I will say that I, I was thinking about it. As you said, I was like, I would be the same probably with Buffy the Vampire Slayer because, and I don't know, maybe that's also what happened to you, but definitely the first, the first chunk of my experience with it was just as a millennial from just seeing it like on TV. And mm -hmm. I think it's almost hard for me to remember how... How many times we watched the same TV show because it was constantly on television, including Baywatch, by the way, fun fact, it was big in Italy for some reason. God knows why. But I think that that was a big part. I don't know. I don't know what's your split, but definitely my split of my favorite TV shows. Probably watched them six or seven times just on, te on telly when they were running at the time. Yeah, I would say that would be similar. Although my my parents, we never had cable. And so I only ever watched at the start or we got it in maybe when I was in high school or something or, or middle school, uh, finally got cable. But I was always at like cousins and friends. And then like later on when I was already a little bit older, then saw it a lot. But I, I, I'm pretty sure I own like the, the whole box set as well. And I just like watched it through on that. And now it's on streaming as well. So yeah. <laughs> oh God, box sets. Yeah. Today we could go down a very, 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 very long memory lane, but we're not, well, again, appreciation for box sets as well. I mean, I'm going to actually down the memory lane because I'm going to ask you a question that goes back in time. Um, Jeremy, what is the first job you ever had and what did you learn from it? Uh, okay. So the first Technically, the first job was as a flyer delivery person. And so that I was probably, it's kind of weird that you are allowed to, I think, I can't remember what the working age in Canada is. I think it's 14 or something like that, but you can get flyer delivery jobs like when you're earlier than that. So I was probably like 12 or 13 or, or something along those lines. And I did that for, I think, two years or something like that. And I remember a friend of mine had, had got a, a delivery job doing that and he was making, you know, like... I don't know what it was, $200 a month or something like that. And I was like, wow, that's so much money. And uh, so I, I, I think through his contact at the flyer company, whatever it was, I got a, a route as well. And it was, uh, my house was actually on the route. So that was nice. Could kind of leave from my house and, and restock and do all that. Um, I, it's a bit tough to say. I wonder what I learned from that. I think there's something about like, it was nice to have like the agency at that age, especially to be able to like, you know, I'd like to have more money and I can go and do this. And there's also something interesting about the, you don't necessarily have any control over this, but it's all kind of unit pricing. And so mm. when there's more flyers that you're, you're packing it, you get paid more, but it's also more work. And so you kind of like on one day, the flyers would just show up like all of the, you know, whatever it is like Walmart flyers in one stack and all the, I mean, a lot of them are like Canadian stores. Uh, so I was going to say like Canadian tires, like our big hardware store at national chain is like, they're classic, you know, flyer kind of company. And so you'd have to like organize all of those the day before. And then the next day you'd go out and actually deliver them and kind of put, you know, each, you got like 200 of each flyer, each in their own stack, you got to sort them, whatever. So when there's tons of flyers, that process of sorting takes ages and then it takes longer to deliver them, but you make more money. And so I think there's something around that just kind of relationship almost between like the amount of work. I, I don't know that that's a necessarily a good lesson I learned, but I think that's something that stuck with me with like unit pricing and like, it, it probably actually is a negative thing of like more work equals more money when, you know, now mm. probably as entrepreneurs, that's something that you really have to unlearn, but is really ingrained. And so maybe that was my, the early seeding of it <laughs> that I'm probably still trying to unlearn. I actually love that you brought this up. First of all, because one of the questions we asked during our class in session section is actually unlearning. So I love that you brought that up. But also I think you reminded us of some of the things that we learn and some of the beliefs that we build through, again, some of the jobs and the experiences that we have that actually then 
negatively or maybe not so positively impact us. So I love that because usually we think about the good things that we learned, like resilience and grit and and the value of hard work or whatever. But we also learn from some jobs and especially from some of the beliefs or even what adults would say to us when mm-hmm. you are young and you're just kind of figuring out what the world of works looks to you. I think we can be more impressionable and or we can actually get a lot more in- you know, impressed and actually in a way biased by what people say. And it can definitely affect the way that we look at work for years to come. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Now with that in mind, let's actually go back into right now. Let's talk about our entrepreneurial journey in a more positive way. And the best way to start is obviously to look at how we're impacting others because yes, all we do is encouraging people to market to hearts, not to brains which means we love to ask each guest, what does making a positive impact mean to you, Jeremy, to your audience, and why? Yeah, this is, uh, I have some interesting thoughts on this, I think. So, because part of, for me, I think especially in a creative industry, I personally feel like there's some people can shoot themselves in the foot sometimes, or we all can by catering too much to the audience and like being too selfless. And I think I've certainly done that and it sucked all the life out of everything I've done and it hasn't been fun. And it kind of is this, uh, kind of like negative cycle where when you don't feel a personal reward from doing it, even though it, you, you start to resent your audience a little bit, cause you feel like you're just giving and giving and giving, and you're not getting anything back. Sometimes even if you are making money from it, it just is not sustainable. And so I've kind of like, what I've realized for my own work is that the almost like the best way to serve others is actually serving myself because that involves going down rabbit holes and exploring new topics and like maybe being more innovative with my ideas than just saying like, oh, peep, there's search intent for this. So I'm going to write another one of, you know, there's already hundred articles, but I'm going to write another one on this to rank for SEO it's actually been kind of like, no, I want to like create stuff that doesn't exist yet that nobody's even talking about. And so that it's like very self-indulgent almost and following my curiosity. And that then kind of has the side effect of then like opening doors for other people where they're like, oh, I've never thought about it that way before. And so it's kind of like this yin and yang thing where like serving yourself sometimes does serve other people better as well. I don't think that's necessarily always the case. And it's not about necessarily like being selfish in every way. I think it's like almost intellectual selfishness in a way of like following your own curiosities and, and kind of, um, following those rabbit trails that they go down. So that would be one thing that I would say when it comes to, um, serving others. The other thing that I would say that is in my like actual work with people more on -on one-on-one, the most And it's interesting. So I teach, you know, marketing as well, specifically to podcasters. And so I think there's a lot of times when people think about marketing, I don't know that people necessarily, especially if you're outside of marketing, you don't really think of it as like artistry or creativity or like there's a lot of soul in it. And I think probably you and I know that like there's, it's chock full of that, like the best marketing is. And so for me, I think the greatest like rush or thrill I get is helping someone like use creative work and podcasting and marketing and being able to like, really like find some like essence of themselves in that in a way that that can come out. And I I just feel like there is so much people who make things like that is such a core part of who they are. And I feel like a, a, like an honor, but also like a thrill to be able to spot that thing and be able to say like, Hey, this is like, this is this like golden nugget inside of you here that like you are holding this back and you need to get this out to people because like there is important work here to be done. And you know, just making the thing isn't, isn't enough. You need, like, you need to get this out in front of people and your marketing is going to be the way to do that. So that to me on the like more one-to-one level, I think is, is where I kind of really feel a lot of that. I love that. And obviously I resonate a lot with all of it, but I want to go back to the first point briefly one more time that you mentioned, because I genuinely believe that curiosity is one of the most powerful skills for any good marketer. Okay. I'm a marketer. So also I'm a creator. So I'm going to say, and also for the best creators. So I genuinely believe that I'm going to go here and say on record, it's okay to be selfish and actually taking care of yourself and refill your cup more. So that, as you said, when you actually share the experiments, the things you try, the good, the bad, the ugly with others, you can do it from a place of having tried things that let's be honest, also your audience will probably look up to that to see how you did it. 
the way you did it, what you have learned so that they can either do it or not do it themselves. So I think you're actually doing them a better service by doing that because not only you show up in a most powerful way, but you actually show up in a way that can genuinely give them value. Not saying that, again, not saying that other ways don't give value, but I think there's the creators, the marketers that I love the most are the ones that actually give me a lot of value by sharing tangible experiences and experiments. And I think it's such a core skill of marketers and that's what we teach as well. And a certification, because once you own that, then regardless of your level of experience, you can always improve because you actually le- know how to become a scientist in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think also the other thing that goes hand in hand with that is I think when you're starting out in marketing and creating anything in an entrepreneurialism, you just like hear this constant refrain of like serving your audience, which is true. But I think where it really becomes value is when you just, you don't even need to think about that. That's just your default mode of operating where like everything you're doing, it's, you know, just unconsciously being channeled into useful things for other people, but you don't have to think about like, how am I now going to like serve my audience? It's just like, it becomes all part of the same pot, like discovery feeds, sharing things that help other people and that feeds more discovery. And it just like becomes this kind of flywheel that it's all just, it's like a pot of stew kind of where it's all just happening at the same time and bubbling around. And you're not like distinctly saying like, Oh, now I'm going to go into research mode. And like, maybe some people are more like that. And now I'm going to go like condense this and consolidate it and share it in a certain way. And like, then I'm going to go do this, you know, separate, like engage with my audience over here. It's really just like all part of the same thing for me. And I feel like that's where it, the, the people I look up to as well. It's kind of like, there's no separation between any of that stuff. I agree. I will say that because of my inner Virgo, I have a bit of that, but then it's it's still a flow because I set up systems. Again, going back to our notion yeah. discussion at the beginning. I think just also because of the fact- here. <laughs> Surprise! We attract <laughs> each other. If you believe in this, everyone, <laughs> dear listener, we do attract uh, each other quite beautifully. Um but I think that's the thing. I set up my flows and systems that, as you said, I can go through my creative process in the best way for me that feels uh, continuous and it feels like it's flowing. So I agree with you. What I would say is that I still have systems for that because that's the only way that my brain actually feels like I, I am getting from A to B. And I think it's just finding the right way for you. So thank you for sharing that because I think a lot of people might be stuck with that and it kind of gives us that freedom to actually figure out our own way a bit more. Yeah. Now, class is in session, which means, yeah, you already learned a lot, Dennis, and I know we're, we're doing pretty well, but we're going to up the ante now. We've got three questions for Jeremy, and the first one is time-based. It's actually a bit of like um, time-based ones. So if you could teach our dear listener and our students one thing in one minute or less, what would you teach us? Do I have to teach it right now or is just this, this is the topic of, uh, of what, uh, I would teach. No, you're actually, you're going to give us something, Jeremy. We want, we want right. meat. Okay. We want actionable meat. And we're going to stick away from, uh, from Seinfeld, I guess for this one. So <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, what it would be, uh, would be to me, I think that one of the things that keeps people from really like getting good at marketing is that they feel it's unapproachable. They don't understand what it is. And so they feel like it's something that they can't do that. You need to be some kind of genius to do it. And I would say that like, for me, the biggest unlock was understanding that most of what we think of as marketing is actually bad marketing. It's the stuff that like the best marketing stuff you don't actually realize is marketing. And so when we have all these ideas of what marketing is and why we can't do it because it feels icky or slimy, or it costs millions of dollars to do Super Bowl ads or whatever it is like, that's not necessarily good marketing. And so most of the most obvious examples are actually not things we want to be doing. And most of the people that we just feel an affinity to people and brands, like look at what they're doing and that is actual marketing. And all of a sudden you start to see that, oh, this is something that can be fun. It can be easy. It can be life-giving and energizing. And I think once you make that shift, like the doors to marketing success just kind of blow wide open. Love that. And it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite things, one of my, f- I'm fun, by the way, I swear, before I say this, I swear I'm real fun. But one of the favorite things I love to do is actually looking for cool campaigns or videos from brands that I love. So yeah, I know that crazy, but obviously then we go back to our little notion. I put it in my little notion, second brain, and that's where I leave all of these. And I really love the idea of, of kind of surrounding myself with those campaigns as well. I think what you said is a great testament to, again, 
looking at great examples of things. And as you say, because they jump out at us, because we connect with them emotionally, breaking them down a bit and realizing actually, then you realize what people have done, whether it's great copywriting, great storytelling. And you're like, oh, it's not just somebody telling a story for random reasons. There is actually a journey that they're trying to take me. And that's the beautiful surprise of great marketing, great messaging and all these things. So thank you for reminding us of that. Now going, back to, now going back to unlearning, I did mention it earlier on. So yes, the question about unlearning is coming and is one of my favorites because I genuinely, as you said, a lot of the things in life we actually have to unlearn because of the beautiful baggage that we all carry. So Jeremy, if you were to think, what is something that you unlearned recently and how did it improve your life or even your work? This is okay. So this isn't the most recent. This is in the past two years, I would say. Um, and I was building an agency, a podcast production agency. And at the end, it was actually at the end of, I think, 2020. Um, so kind of end of, or well, start, I was going to say end of the pandemic. I don't know, maybe we're, we're still in it, um, but was kind of like going into a lot of uncertainty at that time. And I was really looking at, had lost a bunch of clients uh, who had kind of were smaller business owners who had shut down that year, but was looking to kind of like podcasting as a whole was booming. And so I was looking to level up our services to go after much bigger brands and things like that, which is where a lot of the momentum was in the industry. And so went into this brand strategy session and was looking at all the new products and services and like building out the team and hiring all this. And I'd been building the agency, I think for four years at that point or, or five years, something like that. And it just, it had never, I was never really passionate about the agency. I just liked business. And so like, that was the fun thing for me was just building the business and went into this brand strategy session, looking at, you know, rebranding the agency, scaling up, offering new products and services, all this kind of stuff. And kind of at some point in the middle of that, realized that I didn't even want to be, that wasn't the business I wanted to be building. And it was just momentum was like keeping me going that way. Cause I had a lot of sunk costs, but also like just, it seemed like a clear path forward. It was the kind of continuing the, um, the trajectory I was already on and that felt easier than pivoting. And so coming out the end of it, I kind of realized like there was a few questions going through this with the strategist I was working with. And it was just kind of like, oh, this is like something's off. And it, it just became very clear, like what I want to be doing is writing and teaching. And at that point, I had already I had my my podcast marketing academy course, I had done two cohorts of it. But it was kind of this side project thing. And it became very clear, like, no, this is really what I want to be doing long term. And like, why am I focusing right now on doing this thing that it's going to require me, you know, multiple years of like hiring new people, building up products and services, a lot of like oversight, when I can just keep things how it is, and move over to this other thing. And I think the challenging, the, the real unlearning or challenging uh, of the assumption there was that this like that you always need to keep growing the thing you're working on for it to be successful and saying like, actually, no, the way to be successful here is actually to stop growing this, either maintain it or actually wind it down and move over to this other thing to refocus my attention. So I would say that's been the, the really big one of the past couple of years that's really defined this kind of change. There is a lot of resistance with letting go of things. I think whether it's a project, whether it's a, a product or a business, especially because from the sound of your journey with the agency and everything you've been building, you you have been building for a while and obviously there have been some iterations. So again, from the sake of doing Snap again, I can 110% relate because uh, when we closed Creative Impact, which was my other business, as I was giving up the school and the schools were taking more attention, it was more my ego that was stopping me from doing that and the fear of what people would feel about it because we actually had a great community of people. But when I was very open and honest and transparent with myself and with them, actually everybody understood the reasoning and obviously why it was important for me to move towards what I felt my heart was trying to tell me. So I think it's one of those lessons that we need to constantly relearn or the things that we need to constantly unlearn, I guess, which is... Sometimes it's okay to let go. And I love the fact that you said that actually like growth and success doesn't always mean keep at it. Sometimes it means let go of it to make space for something better as well. Yeah. And I, at the same, actually it was around the same time this was all kind of tied up. I had started a podcast. So most of our clients in the agency were in the health and wellness space, which another thing we <laughs> have in common. And um, that was just through referrals, essentially. I didn't pursue that at the time. But at that time in 2020, I was like, okay, finally, I've resisted this for like three years. I'm going to niche down and just like be the go-to 
podcast production agency for health and wellness businesses. And so I started a podcast on the topic and it just like never really clicked. It, it felt too strategic. Like there, I would not have created that show just for myself, like mm. but never in a thousand years. It was like, this is a strategic move for the business. And I put a lot of myself into it and my personality, but like it felt like the right thing to that I should do kind of. And especially as like a podcast expert, I felt a lot of like shame around like shutting it down early. And so I did produce 30 episodes uh, and it was live for six months. But at that point I wrapped it up. And one of the interesting things, kind of like you said, like I got messages from listeners who were like very understanding. were like, yeah, it sounds like we like love the show, but like, you know, it seems very obvious that like your skills are best used elsewhere. And I think that was another thing where I realized after that, like, it was like once I had quit, once I got over that hurdle of like the shame the first time of quitting something, because I thought people would think like, oh, but he's the podcast expert. Why why did he like quit his show so quickly? And none of that happened. And I was like, oh, I feel this extraordinary freedom now to start and quit anything immediately to like test it out. Like the next time if I, because it wasn't about like download number success or anything. It was about the feeling. That was the thing that didn't click. And I would have known that within five or 10 episodes for sure. If it like wasn't happening, like I didn't have that excitement to actually create it. Next time I would be like, okay, I'll do three episodes of the show. Like, ah, no, this isn't the right thing. Like I need to do something else. And I would have no qualms about quitting it. And like, I don't know, I, I have so many ideas that like I, I can only take action on such a small number of them. I want to make sure the things I'm working on are like actually exciting to me. Preach. That's all I'm going to say to that. Uh, thank you so much. The final lesson comes from somebody else. So one is one of the biggest lessons that a teacher, a mentor, somebody you look up to taught you. Whew, this is a good one. I feel like I do so much like learning and education that it's hard to pull out specifics. I... So there's this company, so you're in the UK. And so there's a company, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, called The Do Lectures. They also have a sister company called uh, Hyatt Denim. They're based in Wales, a uh, tiny town on the west of Wales. And this isn't a direct lesson. This is really through observation. But they have a brand video that uh, they were selected by in like a Shopify contest that Shopify sponsored this brand video of their, their company. And it's like a 30-minute brand video. And I remember clicking on this, I was taking uh, one of Seth Godin's Akimbo courses, I think it was the story skills workshop. And one of the lessons was like, it referenced this video, and I clicked on it, never heard of this company before didn't know anything. Um, and keep in mind, like they sell their their jeans are like, 300 pounds or something like they're expensive jeans and i had probably at this point never spent more than a hundred dollars on on a pair of jeans certainly and like would have you know like rolled my eyes at, at spending that much on on clothes for me and i like clicked into this video and realized immediately that it was 30 minutes long and i was like well i'm not watching this and of course though it was a well done video and so like within the first 15 seconds i'm like oh Okay, I'll, I'll watch it like first couple minutes. And like, I swear by the end of the 30 minutes, I was so like amped up about the company that I immediately like went and bought two pair of jeans, like and spent I, like, I don't know, 500 pounds or something on jeans, which like was so against my identity. But there was something about like this, I think has been the most powerful lesson on marketing and building affinity with other people. But one of the most interesting things to me was the way that it was done. And the part of it was the storytelling, but part of it was all these things that were, you almost couldn't dream this up. They were in the DNA of the company that really resonated with me. And so, for example, one of the things, like I feel a super strong affinity to uh, like the coastline of the UK, super random thing. I just like feel a sense of like home and belonging there, uh, Scotland, Ireland, the UK, like, I just like that it feels like my natural landscape. And it feels like there's some like part of me that's wrapped up in that. And their brand and their video like heavily plays on their surroundings. And so immediately, I felt like, oh, this is like, feels like home in some way. And there's just all these things throughout the video that really just felt like, oh, this is like, this feels like a reflection of me. And I think what I really took away from that was that there's all this best practices, all this stuff that you can pull from. But if it doesn't, if you don't find a way to align those with yourself, like I think the stuff that resonates with other people resonates with you. And like there are enough people out there that like we often try, we remove ourselves from our, our work and our marketing and all this stuff. And 
as a result, we we don't really we, we're like chasing this like moving target of like what we think is going to resonate with other people when actually like the answer is inside us. And it's just like create stuff that resonates with you. And like that's going to have this like purity that like resonates with other people as well. And you still need to like package that in a way that is, you know, appealing to other people. But like you have to start with the thing that is is almost true for you. And so I would say like that's the just this big lesson um, on on creating and marketing that uh has stuck with me from and that was actually not from the do lectures as the sister companies from Hyatt Denim, uh, their brand video. Again, we're going back to the marketing examples that I pull as well. I generally love that because I can see that. And I also, I really appreciate that a lot more marketers online start these conversations to bring back the emotional connection and kind of that element of the customer journey and the customer identity as well. Uh, because I believe that you can, learn or read about things like audience personas or even podcast listeners personas and all these things. But as I say, at the end of the day, it's so much about that basic, but not basic psychology that we can actually use and harness that sometimes it shocks me when we cannot take that step back. But I think it's almost a lot of work because we have to unlearn the ways that we assume we should be doing things again. And it means maybe, as you say, focusing on things that maybe you wouldn't you shouldn't focus on on a 30 minute video or, you know, an, an angle that maybe you think, well, who would resonate with that? And I think you reminded us of that understanding that sometimes actually looking inward and actually doing things or showcasing things that actually mean something to you, whether you're the founder, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a creator, is really the way to connect with other people out there that also believe in your values or connect with your passions as well. I think that's another big thing. You're like, well, why should I showcase my passions and not just my beliefs? Because everybody is passionate about something. Everybody's got hobbies and everybody's got things they love. And all the fellow Sandfield lovers will now be like messaging Jeremy, be like, love, favorite quote ever, you know? And these things are the things that we remember, like to the annoyance of a lot of us, including a lot of us marketers, these are the things that most people remember is the little personal touches over some of the bigger pictures sometimes. And they, we can really create a big association with that. Yeah. And you like, I, as a marketer, of course, I've actually tested this now. And so what I have done in a lot of my live presentations is I have my typical like professional about me slide. And I'll say my accomplishments, whatever, like credibility, building stuff. And then I have inserted a second slide immediately after that. And I'll say, and here's all the like the fun, the fun part of me. And I'll say, like, I'm a nerd about like ultimate frisbee and disc golf. And I'll talk about Seinfeld. And I'll talk about like all these other like I try to get in as many quirky things as possible. And of course, for any one of those, like 95% of people, it'll be meaningless, but it doesn't really matter. Like they'll just forget about it. But then if I can put in five of those and each capture this little, like, you know, one to 5% of people who like really remember that, like, I, I know for a fact that that has led to sales of products because people are like, oh, this, like both I'm here in this context of wanting to learn about podcast marketing, but here's someone who is like me in this other way. Now we have these two things in common that aren't related and they're not just like putting this on. It's like, like the, the disc golf is one, which is, it's, it's a super niche, tiny community that people are just a nerd about. And it's like a geeky thing. And so when you meet somebody else who's like that, same with ultimate Frisbee or like rock climbing, or like communities that have strong, like communal identities, those things, like when you meet somebody else within that kind of like notion nerds, like we were talking about, you just immediately understand like, oh, we're, we're alike. We're in some way we're alike. And now we have proof that like, we both like marketing and we both like notion. And maybe we like this other thing and none of these things are related. Then you're just like, whoa, we have so much in common. Like I love this person. I'm going to like follow them and I'm going to subscribe to their newsletter and sign up to their course or whatever it is. And so I think that those things actually matter a lot. And I think a lot of times there's a lot of advice about like staying on topic, but I, I think like, you know, stick, stick true to your message and everything, but pepper it in with all these quirky things about yourself. Cause those are like the little Velcro hooks that people attach themselves onto. And then they're like along for the ride for the rest of the way, because now they have this, this deeper sense of connection with you. You know who I thought of as we were talking about this as well. I think a great example of this, somebody that I genuinely admire in a lot of ways for all of his content and his, his message is Pat Flynn. I genuinely feel he has a lot of that when it comes to 
you get to know whether it's books, whether it's his social, whether it's his podcast, his content. You get to learn a lot about his passions, like the fact that he loves uh, Pokemon. So he has a Pokemon channel as well. And all these things, all these other passions. And, you know, the, I think it was a DeLorean. See, I don't know how I remember yeah. that. I don't remember like yeah. three quarters of his books, but I remember that there was the thing that somebody, one of his fans bought him a, I think a DeLorean Lego or something because they knew about one of the things that he loved, etc. So these things really jump out. So I think... He's a, for me personally, he's a great example of that where he does it in a very effortless way and he's the little things that really can make a massive difference like that. So I love that you brought it up. I think they're also just the things that like make you feel like a real three-dimensional person. I think yes. when you're just like talking about one topic, you feel very two-dimensional and uninteresting, whereas it's like bringing this full picture of a human being into play when like we all know we all have interests outside of what we like talk about on Twitter. Um, and it's nice to know about those other things about other people. A lot of people really, really bang on their love for coffee. And then I'm like, that is very cute, but you haven't seen how many coffees I have a day because that will scare <laughs> anyone. And then everybody's like, yeah, but you're Italian. I'm like, no, 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 don't stereotype me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, maybe you should, because actually I actually do have a lot of coffee, but it's true. Like these little things and that repetition and it kind of like gets people to kind of connect in some way and it's just it gets them you, you mentioned this before as well I'm just going to say one more time it gets people to feel like they know you a bit more sometimes even when you never talk to them which is kind of weird but that's part of it right it's that part of like well because I told people about some of these things I love then that might be the way that they open a conversation with me and I never met them before but they asked me whether I watched the last season of something or if I heard the album for somebody else you know and you know we forget about these things sometimes so thank you for reminding yeah. us of that Jeremy, it's quick fire time. We've got two options and I would like you out of these two options. I'm going to give you a couple of this or that and you're going to choose what you're going to keep out of the this or the that. <clears throat> okay. You ready? Let's do it. First one. This is going to be a hard one. Spotify playlist or podcasts. Is it just the playlists or Spotify as a whole? Mm, let's say if you can choose between listening to a Spotify playlist or a podcast, which one would you keep? Um, I would actually keep Spotify playlists. Nice. Interesting. Voice notes or texts? Uh, texts. <laughs> Ooh, carousels or video like short form video like reels uh let's go carousels tiktok or youtube talking about short form y youtube <laughs> this is one of my one of my faves uh memes or gifs gifs for sure yes <laughs> i'm not gonna say that this is a rite of passage you kind of have to get it right there's no wrong answer but it kind of is. Anyway, um, final, newsletter or Twitter? Oh, man, that is a tough one. Uh, newsletter. <laughs> Why would you choose newsletter over Twitter? Because I can imagine it could be a tough one. I know that you hang out a lot on Twitter. Yeah, that's actually, I guess it depends on the context. I, well, no, I do consume a lot of Twitter as well. I, for content consumption, I definitely prefer and creation, I prefer um, newsletters, but the networking and connection aspect of Twitter can't really be replicated that easily through newsletters. So I feel like I just meet so many friends through Twitter. Um, so yeah, newsletters don't really do that, but when it comes to creating stuff and, and consuming stuff, I prefer newsletters. Love that. Yeah, I know it was a hard one, by the way. I can feel for a lot of people, especially when you're in the creative space and you like you love writing, and especially if you hang out a lot on Twitter. I know there are a lot of people that actually spend time on Twitter will also spend time reading a lot of newsletters. So that's a weird, mm -hmm. funny combination that we have there. Um, so yeah, well done. Now, uh, we're going to slow down the pace a bit for the end, um, and I have a few more questions. I actually come back with this one because it's one of my favorites after quick fire. Um, I love tools. The notion. So my question for you is, Jeremy, what is your favorite underrated tool that you use for your work or even for podcasts, if we want to go a bit more specific? Underrated. I feel like Notion's got, um, Notion's not underrated at this point. It would certainly, like Notion's the tool I spend the most time in. Um, 
all day, every day. Okay, so here's another one. And I was going to say, I've been going down the the chat GPT rabbit hole too. Also mm. not underrated at all with all the hype recently. <laughs> um, but I use, I don't know if you have heard of the browser ARC, the like internet browser, no. uh, ARC. So it's a, it's kind of like built on, I don't really know much about this stuff. It's built on Chromium, which essentially it's like Chrome's operating system, but it is a beautifully designed rethought like browser experience and as like a product it is like stunning and then also it's yeah i i love it i signed up for it i think there's a wait list right now i've waited a long time to get off of it um but i've been on it now a few months and i was skeptical at first and now i like hate going back to chrome whenever i <laughs> have to <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think I think I think the recording only works on Chrome, so it's like, dang. But it's a bit. <laughs> to be honest, it's a bit like when you, what we were using. Oh, Internet Explorer. Oh, do you man. remember those days? Uh, yeah, I do. Dear listener, you might remember it too. If if you are in our neck of the woods when it comes to the timeline, um, yeah, I remember when that was the time, and then it was Firefox as well. And now I feel like if you even try to download Firefox, your laptop goes like, "What are you doing?" What's wrong with you? So it's really, really weird. But we'll definitely check it out. That's a very, very good shout. Thank you. Yeah. Now, what is the last picture you took on your phone? Uh, let's see. The last picture I took on my phone is... Okay, so I am in Montenegro right now. Um, we haven't really talked about this, but I've been doing the digital nomad thing with my partner for the past seven years almost. So we are in Montenegro right now. And... Uh, in a town called Kotor, which is on this amazing bay that is entirely surrounded by mountains. So there's like the ocean and then just steep, steep mountains all the way around it. And so I took a, a photo on my morning walk of, and then there's like an old medieval town with this like oh. castle that like impossibly goes up the mountain like vertically. And so it was of the, the old town and uh, the castle uh, and the mountains this morning on my walk. Oh my God, that sounds beautiful. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, we're going to turn into a travel recommendation section. I'm joking, but not really. Uh, what is the, if we were to go, what would be the one thing that we should absolutely visit or see in the town? Remind us of the name of the town again, one more time, just in case, and then let us know. Uh, so the town is Kotor, uh, K-O-T-O-R. And we actually just got here a week ago today. Oh. So haven't really done too much, but there, I already hiked up one of the mountains last weekend and it was pretty stunning. It was a way harder hike than I had, uh, prepared for it. I mean, it was just like steep and grueling switchbacks up the, the whole mountain. Um, but it was an amazing view at the top. You could like get to the top of the mountain. Then you have views of the, it's, it's kind of like where we are is a bay inside a larger bay. And then there's the, the sea outside of that. Um, and so you hike up the mountain and then you've got like sea views or bay views on both sides. So um, I would recommend definitely while well, checking out like the old castle and the old town here, I think that's probably the one thing to do, but then also doing some hiking. And then I guess there's probably like kayaking and all kinds of water type stuff as well. Oh yeah. Like itching for adventure right now. I'm not sure if dear listener, you feel the same, but I definitely feel that way. Thank you for the little tip off. Now, what is your favorite social media platform at the moment right now? Definitely Twitter. Um, I feel like my, I mean, obviously there's still some uncertainty around it, but I feel like it's kind of subsided. Some of the panic around it from like <laughs> yeah. a month ago is now kind of like, okay, well, everything's still here. Um, so Twitter for sure, kind of like I mentioned, the I feel like I've benefited so much from just relationships through Twitter. Not really, I don't have a huge audience on there or anything. Um, I get newsletter subscribers and I think I've got some customers through that, but really it's like just connecting with people. We connected through Twitter, I'm pretty sure. Yes. And like I've, I've met a number of people in person now that I've met through Twitter and it's yeah been uh, just a wonderful kind of, I mean, if you, if you prune your, your, the people you follow well, uh, it can be a wonderful experience. Love that. So who should we follow? If you can recommend one person that we should follow on the platform, who would it be? One person. Okay. One person on the platform. Well, okay. If I'm going to pick one person, I'm going to pick uh, Amanda Natividad. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with her. Yeah. She's she, hard to, hard to not be familiar with her if you're in marketing and on Twitter. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I would, I would pick her. A couple of my other favorites are Caitlin Borgoyne and Jay Klaus uh, are great as well. Um, those are some of the people I engage the most with on there. 
Amazing. Um, shout out if you want to hear from Caitlin and Jay. Right after this, you can go and listen to the episodes, both from Caitlin and Jay. I'm definitely having Amanda in the pipeline. One day I'm saying it's going to happen. But in the meantime, you can also, right after this, check out those podcast episodes as well because they're great recommendations. Thank you, Jeremy. I've got one more question. Might be one of the harder ones. All right. Jeremy, you got powers. Indeed, you have a power, one specific one which is that you can broadcast one message onto everybody's phone. What would that message be? What would it say? I think it would have to be, I don't know what the phrasing is exactly. I'd probably want to tighten this up from a copy perspective, but (laughs) it would be something about like trusting in yourself and not in like that you can do things like that. Like, I think that's an important part of it too, but that like, the things that excite you and your curiosities are valuable to other people as well. And this isn't like necessarily monetarily valuable every single time, like your greatest passion, like is something that the world wants. But I think we tend to like look for answers outside of ourselves rather than experimenting based on our own intuitions. And I think that that usually does a, us a disservice. And I feel like most of the momentum and success I've had in the past few years has been like, I've read all the books, I've read all the blog posts, listen, binged, listened through all the podcasts. And like, it kind of just felt overwhelming. And it was when I started like trusting like my own instincts and saying like, actually, I haven't seen anyone do this, but this, it, I don't know, it's worth a shot. It feels like it's fun for me to create this stuff or do things this way. Like that kind of like what I was saying before, like the things that resonate with you often have a way of resonating with other people. And so I think just like trusting more in in, in that kind of internal side of, of the, your own kind of, yeah, intuitions, curiosities and all of that. Oh, thank you. What a way to end. I love that. Curiosity is really, in my opinion, a skill. We talked about it before. So I, uh, I think it's a great reminder of that and don't worry about the couple. We can tighten it later. It's a great message. And also if people want to ask you any more questions about marketing, if they want to check your academy, if they want to be friends on Twitter, even more so, Let's give them a reminder. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the place I hang out most is Twitter and I am, uh, I was going to make that really confusing there. My Twitter handle is I am Jeremy Enns. I was going to say I am, I am Jeremy Enns, but, uh, <laughs> easier to say my Twitter handle is I am Jeremy Enns. Uh, and I've also put a page together with all my links and stuff like that, uh, which is at podcastmarketingacademy.com slash alt marketing, all one word. And, uh, I've got a podcast marketing audit there and a bunch of other fun stuff to, to click on and places to find me. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom, for getting grueled by me with millennial questions as well in there every so often. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure and is a pleasure to get to hang out in the online space too. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, in the meantime, as always, class dismissed. <laughs>